Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to Philosophy News. Uh, we're here with Massimo Piglucci. Piglucci, <laughs> am I saying that last name right? Um, yes. Close enough. Uh, <laughs> and I'm really good to uh, be able to talk with you. Um, I've been doing a lot of reading on your, your articles uh, and really fascinated by the space that you're working in. Um, I think you're, you've been labeled a stoic philosopher. Uh, I don't know if those labels are appropriate, uh, but I've been doing <laughs> some reading in stoicism as of late, and um, I've not only found it super fascinating philosophically, but I've also found it very, very helpful personally um, in just dealing with the crazy world that we live in. So I'm um, kind of interested in talking with you a little bit about that. Um, why don't we start out, Massimo, by uh, hearing a little bit about you and your work, uh, what your passions are philosophically and, you know, your focal areas. All right. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, my background is actually originally in evolutionary biology. My first academic career was was as a biologist. And then at some point after my midlife crisis, I switched to philosophy. But I wanted to do it properly, and instead of just being a scientist who plays at being a philosopher, I actually went back to graduate school and you know got my PhD in philosophy because I thought I, I need to be taken seriously by my new colleagues. Um, and a funny fi thing happened on the way to the other side of campus. Basically, you know, I naively, as it turned out, thought that philosophers would take me seriously because I've actually done the work, and, and my old uh, science colleagues would say, hey, this is one of us, you know, we've we known this guy for 20 years. Um, what usually happens is that for the philosophers, I'm still too much of a scientist, and for the scientists, I'm, I'm gone and I'm a philosopher now, therefore it's a whole different thing. And so I find myself in the in between these two worlds, and it's it's kind of a funny situation. But anyway, my interests in, in terms of academia are actually mostly philosophy of science, particularly philosophy of biology, as well as uh, the so-called demarcation problem, the distinction between science and pseudoscience. Then, yeah, in the last few years, I took up as a personal philosophy, uh, you know, stoicism first, and, and now actually I'm, I'm interested in general in the Hellenistic approach uh, to uh, to a life philosophy. And then I started writing about it both in, for the general public and academically, and yeah, this is where I am now. <laughs> Got it. And that's, a, that's an area you think you'll stay in for a while, is that a, it continues to be an interest? Yeah, you know, never say never. I mean, I, I had you asked me to quite, this question like five or six, ten, ten years ago, I would have said, what? Stoicism? What is that? So yeah. um, uh, who knows? But uh, yeah, at the moment, I certainly uh, have a passion for, I do think that philosophy uh, does need to be practical also. I mean, there's nothing obviously wrong with, with philosophical inquiry at an academic level. I still do that. I still publish papers in philosophy science. Uh, but, you know, when it comes to, to the practical part, that's really what's of interest to literally everybody, at least in theory. Uh, uh, and so that's uh, that makes it particularly fascinating. Yeah, I agree. I, I started my philosophical studies largely in the rationalist tradition, um, did a lot of reading in analytic philosophy. So I really just started to explore stoicism and stoic philosophy, uh, you know, just in the last few years. Um, for for our readers and listeners that don't know about Stoic philosophy, and I, I also was reading one of your articles and, and was introduced to uh, Pyrrhonism. Am I saying that correct? Yeah. Uh, yes. correctly? Um, and I, I found that I resonated with a lot of the ideas in that philosophy <laughs> as well, um, particularly around, you know, how to deal with truth and knowledge and those types of questions. Um, right. So would you mind just defining, I know it's probably really hard to, to define such a massive area of philosophy in a, in a short time, but can you define Stoicism and maybe a little of a Pyrrhonism as well, um, just so that our readers can get a sense of what those philosophies yeah. are about? Uh, that's a good question. So Stoicism is an ancient Greco-Roman philosophy that um, is in the Socratic tradition. Uh, so the Stoics, among with, with several other schools, essentially followed up and elaborated uh, on, on the Socratic, uh, general Socratic approach to life. For the Stoics in particular, this means a couple of things. First of all, we should, as they say, live according to nature, meaning that uh, in order to have a good life, a eudaim, what the Greeks called the eudaimonic life, one needs to understand uh, what human nature is about, because after all, we're human beings, and if we if we don't, uh, you know, take seriously the kind of being that we are, you know, uh, then then we're probably uh, going to mislive our life. And as far as the Stoics in particular were concerned, a human being is fundamentally a social being, and it is fundamentally a being capable of reason. That doesn't mean we reason well all the time, of course, but we are capable of doing so. And so that translates, for the Stoics, uh, into a life 
in which you use your brain to help solve problems, uh, especially at a social level. So make make the world a better place uh, through your own efforts, through becoming more virtuous, through becoming uh, a cosmo a true cosmopolitan, a, a person who thinks that the rest of the, the world is made of brothers and sisters or whatever gender we would say today um, people uh, happen to, and happen to be. So that that really in a, in a nutshell is stoicism. Pyrrhonism is actually not a Socratic philosophy. It's, it's a type of skepticism and it's an interesting uh, deviation from the Socratic uh, tradition. There were ba- basically two major deviations within Hellenism from from Socrates. One were the skeptics, the, the Peronian skeptics, because there were actually other kinds of skeptics as well. Uh, and uh, the other one is the Epicureans. The Epicureans were definitely in sort of re- in reaction to Socrates as opposed to followers of Socrates. The Pyrrhonists uh, are one of the two major uh, groups of skeptics. The other one are the so-called new academics, because mm-hmm. They were based in Plato's Academy after, well after Plato was was dead. Uh, however, so we're talking about people like Carneades and Cicero, the Roman Marcus Tullius Cicero. The Pyrrhonists, who are named after Pyrrho, uh, who was the founder of that that approach, uh, essentially thought that a eudaimonic life uh, consists of uh, what the Greeks called ataraxia, that is tranquility of mind. You want serenity. The, the most important thing in, in, in life that you want is serenity. And the way to achieve serenity is to suspend judgment uh, mm. about all sorts of things that are not obvious, that are not evident. So because having judgments, you know, constant judgments about things is actually a major source of stress and anxiety for human beings. And we see that, you know, they had a point. I mean, I'm not, I don't consider myself a Pyrrhonist, but they had a point, uh, right? They, they think about it today, how many people get really upset about political ideas, ideologies, religious ideas, uh, you know, ideas about what peop- what other people should do or not do, uh, ideas about how you should dress or not dress, or what you should eat or not eat. All of these things, according to the Pyrrhonists, are non-evident, meaning that it is perfectly reasonable to hold different opinions. And there is no clinching argument. There is no there is no way really to settle definitively these opinions. So it's just like the best thing you could do, therefore, is just to step back and say, you know what? doesn't matter. I'm going to do what I think I'm going to do, and you're going to do what you're going to do, and it's fine. It's not a problem. That was their, their recipe uh, to uh, a life of tranquility. It's easier said than done. <laughs> because yeah. we, you know we're conditioned uh, uh, by society, especially these days by social media, to really want an, an opinion. I mean, one of the things that struck me as as something that certainly Piro would have frowned upon is a study that I read not long ago, suggesting that um, Facebook had done his own research that clearly showed that the most effective. Uh, kind of like uh, that the, that you could have on your posts is the the angry emoticon, right? Mm. So people tend to be drawn to things that make them angry. And of course, Pierre's response would be, right, that's why you should quit Facebook because it is engineered to make you angry and that's not a good yeah. idea. <laughs> yeah, fascinating. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about that whole concept of rationality and you know w- whether we should withhold judgment and when and how we get to truth in, in a moment. I want to explore this idea uh, of the the um the situation between stoicism and pyrrhonism because they sound in some ways um like they're heading in different directions from a social aspect so yeah. it sounds like stoicism is very deeply ingrained into nature and there's almost a moral obligation that comes from being a human in the world right so if if i were to ask you as a stoic why do you feel morally obligated to your fellow human or I'll use that generic term, that there, there, it sounds like it's because we're all a part of the same environment. We're all part of the same, uh, you know, space in which we live. And so we have a moral obligation partly based in that. And it's probably a lot more compl- complex than that. Pyrrhonism sounds like they want to go the opposite direction, like don't mess in anybody's space, leave everybody alone, withhold judgment, you know. Is that accurate to say that they kind of diverge from a like a social responsibility perspective, or is that a little bit too... Um, too forceful to say that. No, I think I think that's exactly right. I mean, yes, as you said, that this this there's a lot more complication yeah. going on there, you know, in in the background. But but basically, I think you're you're actually right, and that is actually the reason why uh, recently I took sort of, or at least I'm exploring the moment, a third way, 
As I mentioned before, there is a second type of skeptic, of skeptic the, the academic skeptic, the, the Cicero kind of skeptic. And those skeptics, I think, got an interesting compromise, worked out an interesting compromise between two, these two positions, because on the one hand, they, were, they considered themselves Socratics, and therefore, so like the Stoics, and therefore they did think that we have moral obligations to our other people. They did think, they did agree that, you know, being a virtuous person, meaning meaning somebody who works on their character to become a better person, a better member of the human cosmopolis, is mm -hmm. actually a, an obligation. And on that part, I do agree. That is, the, I think, mean, one of the, the best parts of Stoicism, which is incorporated into academic skepticism. However, they were skeptics. And so, unlike the Stoics, who were damn sure what they were saying, you know, the, the Stoics yeah. thought that they really had knowledge with the capital K or T with the you know truth with the capital T, however however you want to put it. Uh, the skeptic, I'm going to call them skeptics from now on, and and if we, if we have to talk about Peter and Peter again, we call them Peteronists, so that because academic sure. skeptics, it's a little, yeah, yeah, it's a little a mouthful, right? So yeah. the skeptics thought, no, wait a minute, we don't have knowledge. Uh, you know, the, you, so perfect knowledge, complete knowledge, final knowledge, it's not a it's not a human thing. And the reason for that is because the two sources of knowledge that we have, reason and our senses, are both fallible. Yeah. They tend to be reliable for, so far as we can tell. You know, most of the times we seem to get a lot of stuff right, but they are fallible. And so we cannot never be absolutely sure that we're getting things right, either when we think about stuff or when we see things or or, or smell things or, or hear things. And so that is why the, the skeptics actually invented these criterion. Uh, that is, then the question is, you know, what is your criterion for action? Because if you think that you don't know, you can never be sure, then on what basis are you going to make, uh, you know, a decision one way or the other? That was, in fact, the major criticism that the Stoics uh, put forth against the skeptics. They say, OK, fine. So you, you think we don't have any knowledge, then then. How do you get up in the morning and make decisions, right? And, you know, if, if everything is really, uh, you know, equally likely. And Carneades and Cicero responded that, no, everything is not equally likely. The criterion is what um, Carneades called pitanon, which uh, in Greek just means something like persuasive. And what sounds more likely to you, what appears to be more likely given the evidence that you have, and which, interestingly, Cicero translated as probabilis, which, of mm -hmm. course, is the root yeah. of the English word probability, right? So essentially, skepticism becomes then a probabilistic kind of approach to things. So certain things appear to be more probable, and therefore I'm going to go with them. Uh, and other things appear not probable, and therefore I'm going to reject them. But in both cases, my approval, my assent, as the ancients would call it, uh, or my rejection are tentative and always open to revision. Right? After all, the word skeptic itself means inquirer, right? So somebody who, who keeps asking questions and, and finding evidence and therefore changing their mind accordingly. Cicero is very clear about this. He says, you know, one of the best things about being an a skeptic is precisely the fact that I don't have to pledge allegiance to a particular idea. I can use it if I think it's useful, but I always reserve the possibility of changing my mind if it turns out that I, I think it, that was a wrong a wrong choice. So I think that this compromise between uh, the, the Peteronists on the one hand, which you're right, tended to be, you know, mind your business, do your thing, it's all about tranquility. And the Stoics on the other my, uh, side that said, no, you really need to be go out there and you know, human cosmopoly, and we're absolutely sure of what that means and how to do it, I think the skeptics uh, charted a nice, uh, reasonable, intermediate course where you say, no, look, I, I do think I have a commitment to other human beings. I want to become a better person. Uh, but how and, and, and that's going to happen, how I'm going to cash that out uh, depends. And, and it varies, and, and I might change my mind about it uh, if, if the evidence becomes compelling. Yeah, that, that's uh, that's really fantastic. It's really interesting to me how epistemology plays such a critical role in how we think about these problems. You know, I, obviously, we a lot of us are struggling with the way that the the dialogue, at least in the United States, is is going on. You know, between the two sides, right? We've got these dramatic yeah. sides, um, and I'm thinking about these philosophies and how they impact. If we were to embrace, for example, skepticism in the way that you just described it, um, what it what it does in the way that you describe it is it helps us move forward. It helps us with action, 
but it reduces the possibility that we're going to become ideologues because we have right. a corner on truth, right? So ideologically, we become nuanced and we can be open to a lot of ideas. But in terms of action, we use probabilities to figure out, okay, this is the direction we're going to go. This is the person exactly. we're going to make. This is the job we're going to take. You know, we're not, we're not paralyzed because we don't have an ideology. I grew up in a very strong religious tradition where, you know, everything was black and white. There was no questions. In fact, doubt was considered a sin, blah, 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 blah. That's right. And what I had was a lot of purpose. I had a lot of purpose, a lot of direction. I knew what mm -hmm. my life was going to be. I knew what God wanted, blah, 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 no doubts. Um, but I was also very, very dogmatic and very ideological. And every other view that didn't align with my specific religious tradition was very wrong, right? Um, and so when I started exploring philosophy, I had obviously a existential crisis, but I had to figure out now, okay, if I don't have that direction anymore, what do I do? Right. <laughs> right? And exactly. so the skepticism you're describing gives kind of both, both parts to that, which is really, really fascinating. Yeah. And in fact, you, you mentioned the, the, the term dogma, uh, yeah. which is interesting because the skeptics were rejecting, were, were reacting to what they thought was, in fact, a dogmatic approach uh, yeah. by several of the other schools, not just uh, not just the Stoics, uh, but you know, the Epicureans, for instance, uh, the Aristotelians and so on and so forth. And dogma in ancient Greek just meant opinion. And and uh, the the, the, the the stoic, uh, sorry, the, the skeptic rejection, the, the skeptic criticism was, look, you, you hold on to these opinions very strongly, but you have no particularly good reason to. <laughs> That's the problem. So the problem is not with having opinions. The problem is that you hold on to those opinions far more strongly than the evidence uh, actually, uh, you know, justifies. Yeah. And and that's where, as modern psychologists would tell you, that's where uh, our opinions become part of our personality, right? Power, part of our identity. You know, when I was, I, I, I lived for nine years in Tennessee and I had a lot of interactions with uh, a lot, with creationists locally. Yeah. You know, that's the, 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 the buckle of the Bible belt. And mm -hmm. I was there as an evolutionary biologist, right? So that was a very interesting period for me. And I realized that that these people are not stupid, uh, you know, they're not ignorant. A lot, I've met a lot of people with college degrees or sometimes even PhD uh, degrees, you know, doctoral degrees, and they're very successful, functional human beings, right? So why do they reject something that to me some, sounded so obvious and so so clearly based on on evidence? And the reason for that is because they've been convinced since they were children that accepting certain ideas, including evolution. Uh, is completely antithetical to a fundamental bit of their identity, right? They are, they've been convinced that if they do that, then they're going to go to hell, whatever that means, or, you know, God is going to abandon them or something. And, and for them, the identity as a Christian is far more important, of course, than the identity uh, as, you know, a biologist or a, uh, somebody who accepts evolution, et cetera. And that's why they reject it. So, it, so which means that you learn fairly quickly that going there and, and debating, let's say, a creationist on the basis of arguments and evidence, it's, it's besides the point. That, is, isn't is. the, the, that isn't what's going on there at all, exactly. right? And, and we see, I think, a very similar thing today in, uh, when it comes to identity in, terms, in, in modern politics. And you know, on both sides of the spectrum, uh, sure. right, right, right or left, it, it certainly takes different forms, uh, and, and uh, I could even argue that some forms are more pernicious than others, but it is a, a almost universal phenomenon. It's not just the United States. I also keep tabbed a little bit of you know politics in, in Europe, in Italy in particular, but also in the UK, uh, and, and it's the same thing. There, there, there is this really strong sense of identity. I ident and and uh, psychologists have done these bizarre experiments, which really makes you despair about about you know human reason and you know so much for the stoics uh, that, that thought that we are these the rational animal or, or aristotle for that matter like one of my favorite was uh, that i read about a few years ago is this situation where a complete group of strangers is put in a room and they're divided and they're given when they enter the room they're given two one of two different t-shirts a, a blue one and a red one and then they and they're told to put them on and then within minutes they, the blue tend to aggregate with the blue, the red with the red, and they start rivalries and they start thinking that the other group is somehow deficient. It's like, 
what are you talking about? This is a random group of people. You had no idea who these people were like yeah. you know, five minutes ago. And now just because you're, you're wearing a different color of shirt, uh, all of a sudden there's a group identity that has been formed. It's, if it is that easy to form, you can imagine it's also very difficult to eradicate. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, Kahneman, Daniel Kahneman, talks about that in Thinking yes. Fast. Well, he he deals with a lot of those similar problems. Um, in fact, the whole book is about the the fact that our brains tend to bypass our reason, or however that works. Like the, our psychology overrides like the rational part of our brains, which is it is kind of uh, super scary. I have to that, say, however, that's uh, sorry to interrupt. This. So no, um, that is one thing that the Stoics did get right. The, yeah. the one that you just said. That it, although of course they hadn't read Kahneman, but they had this understanding, you know, sort of intuitive understanding that one of the problems is precisely that reason takes time, that you need to slow down and allow reason to kick in and and think about stuff and all that. That is why Epictetus, one of the most influential of the Stoics, early part of the second century, famously says in uh, in his discourses, like. Uh, Consider an impression. Impression is an automatic judgment that we arrive at uh, whenever we see or hear something. This is consider an impression and talk to, to it and say, wait a minute, you might not be what you what you look like. So let me let me take a minute here and then think about it. In other words, and Seneca, another Stoic, in on anger, says that the the way to to address anger is not to try to suppress it because that's impossible. It's not to try to uh, you know sort of overcome it in, in in any way. It's just to take your time. Slow yeah. down, let it subside a little bit, and then come back and say, "Why the hell was I angry about this thing?" Right? Mm -hmm. But you can't do it in a moment because in the moment it's it's what Kahneman calls system one that is in charge, and you act, you react very quickly and without really giving time to your rational thinking. So rational thinking does work, but it requires uh, training. It requires uh, you know, the ability to slow down, the ability to distance yourself from your own emotions, uh, from in, in the moment emotions. And, and that's why for the Stoics, that's a lifelong training. It's not, it's not going to happen overnight. Yeah. And, and boy, is that ever important these days? Cause it seems like we're going in the exact opposite direction. I think I had a question in here about, you know, something about how do we, how do we navigate this in the world where, you know, Twitter kind of rules the the dialogue, right? I, I want to get there, um, but I, I want to talk about a question related to an article that you wrote recently, because I think it dovetails very nicely into the conversation we've been having. And I'll put a link up on the page uh, that's hosting this video with a link to this article and all your other um, your other articles. But you talk about the distinction between rationality, logic and truth and how people can be um, rational and even logical, but the conclusion to their argument could be false. And that's a hard right. distinction for people to, to get their heads around, particularly if you're not trained in what logic is, right? Because you can have a valid argument, um, even with one true premise, but the conclusion could be false because something's gone wrong in the argument. Can, yeah. can you talk a little bit about that and, and what you're trying to go after in that article? Because the, what I read is that you're giving us a model for conversation. You're giving us a model for how we can slow things down and recognize that someone can be rational, even though I disagree with them. But I want to I want to hear you articulate kind of what your goals were in that art, article, and if you can summarize kind of your main points there. Right. So the one of the fundamental ideas in in that article is that when we talk to somebody with whom we strongly disagree. Uh, again, especially if we're talking about politics, religion, et cetera, et cetera. Unfortunately, we have a tendency to think that the guy must be stupid or at least not thinking right, because of course we are thinking right, right? You know, we, we are obviously on the right side of things and therefore it, it follows logically that the other guy must be wrong about, about something. Um, that of course, immediately, if you start thinking that way, which comes fairly naturally, unfortunately, uh, that immediately precludes any, any, any forward discussion, right? Because at that point, you're not actually listening to the other person. You're not trying to understand the argument. You're simply prepared. Whenever the other person is, is talking, you're simply preparing your response, your rebuttal. Uh, you're not really listening, right? And uh, again, the Stoics had something to say about this. Uh, they were big in the logic, but, but Zeno of Citium, who was the founder of Stoicism famously said that we have one mouth and two ears because we're supposed to listen twice as long as we talk, right? <laughs> Which is not a bad, it's not, it's a bad, not bad advice at all. <laughs> but, so um, now the Stoics in general thought that 
what we need to do is not only to train ourselves in logic, what they call logic, but, but what they call logic is far broader than what we refer to as in, in, in modern language. You know, logic for us is, is you know, formal logic. It's, it's the, the study of, of uh, the structure of arguments, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That's great. I mean, that's certainly useful. The, 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 the Stoics did do that. But by logic, they actually meant a far broader uh, set of activities, which include dialectics, for instance. So the, the ability to talk to people, uh, it, they included rhetoric. Uh, you know, whenever I talk to my uh, colleagues, especially in the sciences or science co science communicators and scientists who do, uh, you know, who write for the general public, they don't want to hear about rhetor rhetoric because they associate the word with manipulation. Like, ah, yeah. so it's, it's rhetorical ploy, right? Or it's like you're, you're trying to manipulate people emotionally, et cetera, et cetera. It, it, they unfortunately have never read Aristotle, uh, for instance, uh, who wrote what I think is still today the book on, on, on rhetoric, where he says that, look, if you want, if you're talking to somebody else, then you're talking, we're, we're talking about persuasion. So you're talking about, you want to change uh, uh, somebody else's mind or at least perspective or, or at least get them in a situation where they're, they're entertaining a different idea. So what you need are three things. The logos. That means getting your arguments right, right and getting your facts straight. And that's all that my colleagues tend to care about. Uh, the, the scientists that I'm talking about, right? So when they go and debate a creationist, let's say, they only care about getting the arguments and the facts straight. And because they're scientists. And Aristotle said, yeah, that's great. I mean, you have to do that because if you don't do that, then obviously the rest doesn't matter. I mean, now you're trying, you're trying to convince somebody of the wrong thing. So it's like, no, that obviously you, you need to get facts and arguments straight. But that by, by itself is not sufficient because you're not talking to an artificial intelligence based on only logic. You're talking to a human being, right? So you had to do two other things ethos and pathos, right? Ethos means you have to establish your credentials. Now, when I say that to some of my colleagues, they say, oh, but I have a PhD in whatever, physics. Now, that's not what I mean by credentials. I mean, that's that's fine. That's that's okay. It's not a, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean credentials with the particular audience that you are engaging. You have to make, uh, to put forth uh, some kind of argument or ways so that the audience is going to trust you. It's going to see you as trustworthy as somebody that they can listen to instead of being you know antagonistic to and that is subtle it's tricky you know it's not it's not easy if you're dealing with an audience not of undergraduate students in physics but of you know creationists uh and you know that sort of stuff that's number two and number three and that's the part that that my colleagues really don't want to hear is the pathos which means making an emotional connection you have to make an emotional connection. You have to make sure that the audience gives a, a crap about why they might entertain changing their mind. Why is it that what you're saying is actually relevant to them personally? And whenever I say that to my colleagues, the response is, oh, but that's uh, that's emotional manipulation. And, and I say, no, it's emotional manipulation if you do it nefariously. Otherwise, it's just a perfectly reasonable way of dealing with human beings. Why should I care? about what you're saying. You, you need to convince me that there is a reason uh, for it. But of course, those are much more difficult. The ethos and the pathos are much more difficult than the logos. You know, anybody can master the facts about climate change or evolutionary biology. But, but then trying to convince others who are, in fact, on the other side of, of, that, of those debates that they should be listening to you, that they should care, et cetera, et cetera, that takes a hell of a lot more more skill. So part of that argument, the argument that I was making in that article you, you're referring to, is that we, and by we I mean, you know, scientists, science popularizers, and it's, you know, the rationalists, whatever, whatever group you want to identify, are a little too quick to dismiss other uh, people's opinions on the basis of, oh, that's irrational, that's stupid, that's not, that's ignorant, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. While in fact, uh, what might be happening is that the other person is simply starting with different premises. They're reasoning perfectly fine, but they're, they're starting with different premises. And therefore, as again, both Aristotle and the Stoics will tell you, is in that case, instead of attacking the reasoning, you need to attack the premises. You need to say, wait a minute, why are you starting? First of all, you, you need to identify those premises. They might be, you know, nobody, very few people go around saying, 
you know, presenting a, a formal argument of, about what they're what they what they believe, right? You know, premise one, premise two, premise three, therefore conclusion. So a lot of the times the premises are hidden. They're not they're not clear. They might not even be clear to themselves. Yeah. Uh, you know, sometimes we make arguments that are based on premises that might not be clear even to ourselves. And that's why a dialogue, that's why a conversation, it's it's a good thing because the other person is going to say, wait a minute, where does that come from? Why do you believe this? You know, why are you thinking in, in, in that in that fashion? Um, so the basic idea is do not assume that other people are being irrational just because they disagree with you. Uh, in fact, given the benefit of the doubt, assume that they are human beings capable of, you know, at least some level of, of logic and rational thinking, and then start asking yourself, so given that, why are they still getting to a conclusion that I think is misguided or incorrect or something? And, and then you, you, work, you work your way back from there. Yeah, and as you said, that takes time and it takes a little bit of skill, right? I mean, you have to develop that discipline over time. And, you know, when you're first starting to do that kind of work, it can be very emotionally taxing because you do have to put the brakes on, <laughs> right, and, and kind of explore that. And then you talked uh, earlier about how a person may hold a, a worldview because it's central to their identity. It may have nothing to do with argumentation, which you also have to suss out. So hitting someone with an argument on something you disagree with when it has nothing to do with whether it's true or false right. is something you have to analyze as well. And you might have to work on some other things, right? And work on those other identity things first before you get. Yeah. And it is, that is one le lesson that I learned the hard way when, again, I was, when I was interacting with creationists in, in back in Tennessee, that is, Sometimes, once again, Aristotle is right. Aristotle said that, you know, if you're talking to somebody whose premises are completely incompatible with yours, you're not talking. You're just talking past each other. There is there is no conversation going on. And so sometimes the hard uh, truth to accept is that there is no point in having the con that conversation at that particular time between those two two particular people. So what I, when I realized that, I started doing something different. So, uh, you know, I, somebody would come to campus um, and ask me if I wanted to debate so-and-so. And initially I said yes, and it was kind of fun. It was an interesting experience. I mean, you certainly learn things. But at, at some point, as I said, you know, that's, I'm not the right person for doing this kind of thing. Uh, because my own premises, not only scientific premises, but even philosophical premises, I'm an atheist, for instance, uh, are too far removed from the other person. And I am, I'm, I'm only going to do damage, actually, uh, if, I, if I participate. So instead, I say, you know, call my friend or my colleague, for instance, one of my favorite targets was uh, 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 redirect target was Ken Miller, who is a, a mm. cell biologist at uh, Brown University. Why Ken? Because Ken is an evolutionary biologist. He knows just as much evolution as I as I do, but he's a Christian. Yeah. Right? And now he's not necessarily that kind, particular kind of Christian. And I understand that that yeah, in sure. itself, of course, is, yeah, exactly. yeah. You know, that, that, that in itself can be a problem. But that's a minor problem. It's a it's a lesser problem, I would say, not necessarily minor, but lesser problem than having me going on on stage. Why? Well, because Ken knows exactly where these people are coming from. He has faith in basically the same kind of things, you know, give or take a few minor points of of, of doctrine. So he talks their language. When they throw the Bible at him, you know, I read. I grew up Catholic, so I I did read the Bible. It's not like you know, I, I read the Gospels, but. That's not my thing. I, I don't, I'm yeah. not going to argue on the basis of uh, that. It's just like, no, that's, that's not what I do. But that is what Ken does. And so if, when a creation says to Ken, oh, but the Bible says so and so, he can actually answer from the point of view, not just as somebody who has read the stuff and thought about it, yeah. but from somebody who actually believes essentially sure. the same kind of things. And so... That and there is pretty good evidence actually in psychological literature that when people change their mind about things that are dramatically uh, uh, part of their personal identity, often not always, but often the first step comes precisely from being exposed to somebody with whom they share most of their worldview, and yet that person has different ideas. That is what makes because it's too easy for them 
Just like it's easy for me to say, oh, you're a creation, therefore you're an idiot. Um, it's easy for them to say, oh, you're an atheist, therefore you're evil. That's it. End the story. That, 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 it, there's no conversation at that point. It doesn't matter what comes out of our mouths in the, that, that pretends to be a conversation. It's not. It, and therefore, sometimes the wisest thing to do is just to say, you know, I'm, this is not the right occasion. This is not sure. the, right, the right. I can do some good somewhere else, and I'm going to call somebody else because they can do better. Yeah, and I, I I totally agree with you. I think this is the big mistake that the the and I'm going to call out some names here, but the Dawkins and the Hitchens of the world's kind oh, of yeah. made is that they 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 may have had a a, a goal, a noble goal, but they mm -hmm. hit it so hard and like calling an entire people group delusional just doesn't land. Like th yeah. there's other ways to accomplish the same goal without just coming at it so harshly. I think you know they they need spokespeople that can help yes. them soften the message exactly. and present the ideas rather than having to go out and do that themselves. But you see that you see that a lot. Um, in that article, in fact, you talk about right reason and wrong reason. Um, and you use your kind of your rejection of creationism in talking with creationists as an example where you say, uh, I, I'm going to read the quote. You say, I think my rejection of cre creationism is right reason while it's in, uh, it's embrace is bad reason. Now, you know, you're you're making a good comparison there. You're saying the creationist is reasoning improperly. Um, but what I wanted to call out here is the is the phrase I think, because it relates to the skepticism idea that we're talking right. about, right? Now, you you don't you don't make the claim the creationist is reasoning badly or have is using bad reason. You say I think they are. Right. Um on your on your view, is that the best we can say? Is that the best we should say? Should we ever make the dogmatic claim? that creation is is wrong or do we always have to qualify it on my point of view based on the d evidence that i have right i think right how do you how do you how do we nuance that that type of language that we're yeah. going to be so i i've come to think that yes we should always qualify it now how you qualify it that depends on the context and i mean you know it, it does become bothersome to say everything that I, you say accompanied with you know possibly or likely or whatever it is but it should always be qualified at least implicitly and if, if whenever it's possible explicitly i mean that for that's for two reasons one is i am actually convinced that we really don't like with with cicero and carneades that we really don't have access to the to truth with the capital t yeah. uh you know, and last year I was at um, uh, at the uh, How the Light Gets In festival in in London. Yeah. And, you know, I'm about to go to the one in Hay next week, and um, uh, we were on a panel, and the skepticism stuff came up. And you know, one of my colleagues there on the panel said, "Oh well, really, you're not sure that two plus two is equal two? which is, of course. You know the funny way to put in to put the the question. You know, to put the skeptic on the defensive. But my response is serious, like. No, I'm not. For one thing, because for all I know, my brain may actually be suffering from some some kind of you know anomalies. I mean, I've had uh, an episode uh, not long ago of of brain fog where all of a sudden I couldn't type on my uh, on my keyboard, and yeah, it was a yeah. really strange sensation. And I, you know, if you look at the lit at the neuroscience literature, you know that these things happen. So no, I'm not absolutely positive. You know, should would I bet on it? Yes, I would. If I, in you know, in day-to-day -day life, the notion that two plus two equals four is in fact fairly high in terms of confidence <laughs> yeah. on on my. It, it works pretty well. Skin. But absolute absolute truth. Well, I don't know. Besides, I can challenge you to actually give me a proof of the fact that two plus two equal four. And if you looked into the mathematics, the logic of mathematics, you'll know that that proof is actually pretty difficult to, yeah. to come by. It's not really an obvious thing at all. But the more important thing is, look, you can come up with trivial, uh, you know, zingers like that is all oh, really, you don't believe it. But, but that's missing the major point. If you want me to say, sure, except for obviously evident things, uh, Fine, if you want me to qualify that, I'm, I'm okay with that. But I think you're missing the, 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 the really important point, which is for anything that actually has a complex idea based on complex empirical information, then we should never say, I absolutely know that that is the case. One of the reasons we shouldn't is I read um, many years ago when I was a, a young evolutionary biologist, one of my favorite books was this thing, it was called 
scientific blunders. Okay. And it's just a collection of, yes. right, of episodes where throughout the centuries where scientists were absolutely sure of X and then X turned out to be, in fact, wrong. And my favorite, I think, was the very, if I remember correctly, was the first, the very first chapter of a famous astronomer who in 1957, I think, said with absolute confidence that human beings will never put an artificial satellite in orbit around Earth. Three months later, Sputnik mm -hmm. goes up. Three months. Right? That's what I'm talking about. So, so yeah. it's like we, we have very, I mean, you know, physicists were absolutely sure that Newtonian mechanics was it. You can go back, you know, we tend to forget these things because a lot of scientists, unfortunately, don't study either philosophy or history of science. And that's too bad because we tend to forget, for instance, that there are major physicists like Lord Kelvin, who wrote at the end of the 19th century that physics was basically done. They, mm -hmm. they thought, yeah, but that's it. I mean, there, there's a few details here and there we need to work out, but that's basically it. And then within two decades, both general relativity and quantum mechanics happened. And it's like, no, the hell we're done with it. It's like all of a sudden there's a whole new uh, vistas that have been opened. So, so I think that, and, and the other thing is, what do we lose in being a little bit more modest with our claims? What, what is it really that I lose if I say, instead of saying, no, it, this is absolutely it. If I say, well, I'm fairly confident of this and this is why. What, what exactly did I lose in, the, in, that, in that transaction? I think nothing. And in fact, I think I gained in intellectual honesty uh, on the one hand and possibly even in the ability to persuade somebody else because you know, nobody really likes uh, somebody who get, comes up and, and says, this is absolutely the case and that and that's it. Yeah, it, it's, that's, a, that's a really, really important question, what we lose, because I think a lot of people think we do lose a lot. So if you look, I, you know, obviously, I'm sure you do the same thing. You look at the dialogue that's happening culturally, and it seems like everything gets ratcheted up when the other side ratchets things up. It just keeps escalating. So if I, if I qualify something, I say, I think creationists are wrong, rather than saying creationists are wrong. Um, then you open the door just to crack where someone will come after you and say, well, I think you're wrong, but I'm really confident that you're wrong. And then they they amp up the rhetoric, and I'm using rhetoric yeah. in the common way that people use it, right? So then you might have to come back and say, well, I'm 98% confident that you're, you're like, you know, you have like that conversation goes back and forth. Right. So I think what people fear that they lose is that edge to right. like debate or conversation. And you see that in politics all the time, right? So you get the extremes that make all the news because they're making these absolute confident no holes barred types of statements and the people that are a little bit more qualified in their judgments get lost in the middle right now and Correct. again i'm making generalizations here but just in terms of how the the conversation happens and i think that's a really really tricky thing to manage right so there's a lot of psychology there there's not a lot of uh, epistemology but that psychology to the point that we were making earlier really plays a role in how people talk to each other absolutely it's it's it you know, uh, epistemology is, of course, very important, but it's always psychology because we're talking yeah. about human beings again, right? <laughs> um, I think that the difference you're you're talking about, you're absolutely right. I think in that uh, in that, or you're probably right in the dis <laughs> <laughs> in that well, distinction that. you were making. And I think that distinction there is between a conversation and a debate. That's why I have made a point years ago to actually never ever again accept to debate anybody. Uh, if we're talking having a conversation, yes, a debate, it's it's not the thing. What's the difference? In a debate, a debate is adversarial. Right? You want to win. The point of the debate is you want to win. And therefore, you start doing the kind of things you just described. Right? You, you push things. And then the other guy, of course, counter pushes. And then you have to counter counter push. And things get out of control pretty, pretty quickly. And you don't really get any kind of resolution. A conversation, on the other hand, is a communal search for truth. Or at least for a better position than you started with, right? And of course, the classic, the quintessential example is a Socratic dialogue. And uh, people that start reading, you know, when my students start reading the, the Socratic dialogues, they get, they get frustrated because many of the dialogues end in aporia, which yeah. is a Greek word for impasse, right? There, there's no conclusion. There's no, it's like you get to the end of it, it's like, so what was justice? I, I, yeah. I don't yeah. know what justice is at the end of the whole damn thing. So what yeah. did I read this for? Well, but you now know several things that justice is not. 
right? You now have actually a better idea of the landscape, the conceptual landscape that uh, that defines the concept of justice. And in fact, the, the very fact that you don't have a conclusion is a invitation to humility, right? It's something that you say, oh, turns out I've been talking to Socrates now for you know an hour and and even he hasn't been able to give me a, a definition of justice. So, so perhaps I should be a little bit more careful about, uh, about, about things. But that's a, the fundamental difference, that conversation. And it is hard. It really is hard. I mean, I can see it on myself. Uh, it, it, I had to be constantly on guard with myself because otherwise I do have a tendency to overstate my case in, uh, in, in a situation that feels more like a, a debate than, than, a, than a conversation. But I have to remember, the point is not to clubber the other person on the head, metaphorically speaking. The point is to have a better common understanding of whatever it is that we're talking about. So conversation, yes. Debate, no. Uh, common improvement, yes. Winners and losers, no. I, I actually wrote an article for Philosophy News where I talk about how to talk with other people, how to have a conversation with other people. And that's the way that I actually phrased it is almost very um, similar to what you said is where it's two people, you know, kind of looking for truth rather than two people debating each other. It's, exactly. it's, it's two people against ignorance. If you want to, if you want to be against something, it's not Correct. each other, it's against ignorance and you're looking, you're on that journey together. And I love that metaphor. I think it works really well. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left in our scheduled conversation. Are you good to keep going? Yes. Okay, great. I, I wanted to explore a, a, a three-part series that you did, which is very much in the the same uh, you know topic area that we've been covering. But it's such a a, a rich um, area to explore. But you were talking about uh, skepticism in that series, and you broke it out into three parts. Um, the first one was uh, I think focused on fallibilism. Correct? Do I have that right? And that was yeah. I'm thinking about mm -hmm. the series. And fallibilism is really what we're talking about here, right? So right. you know. The idea, and I think you know, philosophers use the term defeasibility. A proposition is defeasible. You can, it can be, always be undermined by new evidence or new data or a cognitive block that you didn't know you had, a blind spot, whatever. Um, so, so talk a little bit about uh, how you um, use fallibilism in that context. Um, I'm going to read a couple of quotes here because I think they summarize, and then you can expand upon that. Um, you say that. Um, Fallibilism is not the notion that all beliefs we currently hold or will hold in the future are false. Rather, it is the belief that all beliefs that are considered justified should be held as provisionally true and nothing more. So um, I was actually talking with somebody about this interview and she was asking, you know, what does that mean? What does that distinction mean? And I said, well, it's a distinction between saying that my beliefs are false versus saying that I believe they're true, but they could be false in the future. That's right. <laughs> right? That's exactly that, right. That's why. Yeah, describe it once. Or is That's that exactly right. Um, I think so. So that that uh, series uh, of three essays you're, you're you're referring to, um, I wrote it because I thought that it would be interesting for people to explore the foundation, in a sense, or the structure of skeptic epistemology, because skeptics are often uh, portrayed as just people who don't believe anything, or you know, who say no, 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 no that sort of stuff, right? Uh, it's, in fact, it's kind of, if you if you allow me for a second, th th there's an interesting uh, parenthesis to open here. So the names of all of the major uh, Hellenistic schools of thought are still with us today. Epicurean, Stoic, uh, Skeptic, Cynic, right? But all of those meanings have been distorted, right? A skeptic started out as somebody who wants to, who, who is inquiring into things, and now it, being, it means somebody who always, always, always says no. A cynic uh, started out as somebody who was flaunting, you know, social rules, and now a cynic is somebody who is just an intractable person, who just, just it's very, very annoying and, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, an Epicurean started out as somebody who pursued a simple life of simple pleasures and avoidance of pain, and now it's sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And a Stoic started out as somebody who pursued virtue by by moderating his, his or her emotions, and now it's a kind of a Mr. Spock with with stiff upper lip, uh, that sort of stuff. So it's interesting to me that the, the terms are still with us, and yet now we have to fight about, yeah, but that's not what it means. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Um, so back to, to skepticism. No, skeptics are not people who just say no. They're, they're people who are interested in inquiry. But on what basis um, do we inquire? 
And one of those bases is fallibilism. That is this notion, as you say, that whenever I think I accept provisionally a particular notion, I always remind myself that there is a reserve clause, essentially, that is, that notion could be wrong. So I'm accepting it provisionally because I think that as it stands now, my understanding of the evidence and the arguments is such that I am inclined to go in that direction. Uh, and in fact, I'm inclined to go in the direction in, in a proportional way. Uh, David Hume, who also was a skeptic, although of a more modern bent, famously said that a wise person proportions their beliefs to the evidence, right? Yeah. And there's this nice that nice concept of proportioning one beliefs, meaning that your beliefs are not zero or one. They're not yes or no, uh, right? And, and, and that's because the evidence is usually not clear cut. Uh, it, if the evidence is very strong, my belief is going to go 80%, 90%, 95%. If the evidence is not that strong, it might be in the middle, 50%, 60%. And if the evidence is really weak, I go down to you know 10 or, or 20%. Uh, some of your listeners might recognize there a Bayesian approach to things, mm -hmm. right? So the modern version of doing of 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 cashing out this, uh, these, these ideas is to use bias theorem in, in uh, conditional probability theory, which basically says essentially the same thing, that, that your beliefs should be updated uh, with new evidence and that your beliefs will always vary between zero and one, not hitting either one of those two walls. You never go to zero and you never go to one. Why? Well, Bayesian, Bayesianism tells you mathematically why. If you are at zero or at one, it turns out if you look at Bayer's equation, then there is no way that your beliefs can be further altered by new evidence. You, know, you become impervious to further yes. evidence. Psychologically speaking, what that means, you're now a true believer, uh, right? Either either a complete disbeliever yes. or a complete yeah. believer. And that means, again, that you, 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 you crossed from, from somebody who's responding to evidence and arguments to an ideologue to somebody who just believes, uh, you know, 100% or 0% into something, and that's it. Nothing is going gonna, is gonna to move. And I, I don't think that's a good position to be. So fallibilism is one of, of the three components of uh, a skeptic, a good, uh, sound skeptic epistemology. The other two are coherentism and probabilism. Right? Um, so probabilism goes back to this notion that both Carneades and Cicero put forth, so, although they, of course, put it in terms of in qualitative terms, and I would put it in modern quantitative sort of Bayesian terms, but it's the same idea. And the notion is, uh, you know, we hold things to be true with a certain probability. That that is, truth is not actually yes or or no. You know, as, as I just said, 100% or nothing. It's it's a matter of degrees. And uh, and it should be, and our estimate of that truth should be adjusted accordingly. And coherentism is this uh, notion that, uh, which actually, interestingly, and so coherentism is is uh, most famous in philosophy because of, of Quine uh, uh, influence in the middle part of the 20th century. But it actually goes back to all the way to Carneades, to an, like, almost two and a half millennia ago. So it doesn't um, go back to the Greeks. I know, right? <laughs> One criteria that, that Carneades put forth was, he says, look, look you, you should be confident, more confident of things if you looked into it very, very deeply, but especially... So if you've examined a particular notion in, a, in, a, in, 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 a, in depth, but especially if it coheres with other things, right? And this, is what, this was because that means that, uh, that other notions essentially reinforce the one you're interested in precisely because it goes well, it coheres with the rest. Again, that doesn't mean it's true. But it, sure. but the chances of of you know it's that more no, probable. is more probable becomes more probable. Uh, when I was in fact debating creationists, one of the things that I kept pointing out was like, look, you're not just rejecting evolutionary theory, which would be you know bad enough given the evidence and all that sort of stuff, but you're actually rejecting uh, most of geology, most of chemistry, most of physics. Because these things cohere, they go together. I mean, how do we, how do evolutionary biologists know that the Earth is four billion years old, uh, give give or take? Well, that's because of geology and chemistry. Uh, you know, it's not yeah. it's not like we invent. It's not like evolutionary biology invented that notion out of thin air. So if you reject that notion and you say, oh no no, uh, evolutionists are wrong. The, the Earth is only six thousand years old. You're not just rejecting evolution. You're not just rejecting Darwin. You're also getting rid of most of science. Now, 
you could do that, but then, but now you have a much, much bigger big job problem. to replace, uh, you know, the entire edifice. You don't have to replace a single theory. You now have to replace a bunch of fields that are interconnected. That's where coherentism uh, becomes a, an interesting notion because it basically says, look, the more things fit together, it's like a puzzle, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you put a, if you put a new play piece in, a, in, in the puzzle and it fits, that doesn't mean, if you've you know, ever done puzzles, that doesn't mean 100% that it is really in the right place. You could still be mistaken, especially if you're in the early, uh, you know, uh, early, early process, you know, early, early uh, putting together of, of the puzzle. You could still be mistaken. But the more it fits, the more you can be confident that, yeah, that's, that's, that's right. I'm, I'm getting the right picture here because they all fit. It's not just a single piece. It's the ensemble. I had a I had a colleague that had a specific uh, view on something, and I asked him why he held it, and it's kind of a similar idea, but he put it in the negative. He said it's because it's the view with the least amount of tensions. <laughs> and yeah, I, I didn't sure. underst- I didn't understand <laughs> it at the time, but over time, like okay, now I get what he was saying. It's like it does cohere with a lot of other things, and so it gives me the least problems if I hold this view over exactly. over this other view. So that's kind of a nice way to put it. Um, we're close to being out of time, but I want to just ask you one more thing. And I, I don't know if we can do this quickly. We might have to have another conversation about it. But I'm really interested in how Stoicism ties in with this epistemological approach. Because I think when I read Stoics, a lot of it is about how to live a good life, right? Or how to deal with what life gives you. So it, it has like this ethical component. And what we've been talking about is epistemology. So how, yeah. do you see how uh, ways that Stoicism can inform this type of skeptical approach to life and help uh, provide an ethical uh, approach to it, an ethical edge to it. And like I said, that might be a very deep question that we don't want to explore now, but do you have like a quick, maybe a quick insight into that? And then we can maybe pick this up another time and talk through that. Sure. Uh, Yeah, you're right. It is a a fairly large (laughs) topic, but a, a couple of quick things. First of all, the Stoics themselves, and in fact, not just the Stoics, but a lot of the other Hellenistic schools uh, after Plato uh, agreed that there are three components to the to the good life that you need to study three things interconnected. One is what they call physics from from the Greek physis, nature, right? Uh, and uh, in other words, what we would today call science, uh, broadly speaking, logic, in the sense that I we were discussing earlier, broad, broad, broadly construed, and then ethics in the sense again broadly construed of how to live your life, and the basic notion was: look, if you want to live a good life, you want to figure out how to to be that, become you diamond, having having a life worth living. Uh, you need to pay attention both to good reasoning and to how the world works, because if you don't, if you reason incorrectly about things, or if you misunderstand significantly how the world works, then you're likely to make mistakes in terms of how to live your life. So the epistemology, therefore, is embedded right there into the ethics because it depends on how you connect the ethics to the logic and the physics. So that's one way to answer. The other way, uh, and that is why I am leaning toward a sort of the skepticism, uh, you know, stoic friendly skepticism, I would say. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a good way to put it. The, yeah, the 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 way I, I'm approaching things this at this point is very much inspired by the way Cicero did. Cicero famously was very sympathetic to Stoicism. He took on board a lot of Stoic ideas, especially ideas about cosmopolitanism, ideas about justice, ideas about virtue, and all that sort of stuff. But he was also critical of the Stoics. Um, because he said, look, you guys are saying things that you have no business saying. Like in, in On Divination, for instance, he goes you know, yeah. on a blistering attack on the, yeah, on the stage. He said, what the hell are you talking about? Divination, astrology. No, that doesn't work. In fact, uh, you know, he, he wrote basically the, the, the first uh, treaty in the, in the Western tradition that I know of, at least, on pseudoscience. <laughs> Essentially, or what we would today call pseudoscience. So the Ciceronian approach, the skeptic Ciceronian approach, I think is is a really good model. Not because Cicero himself was right on everything, of course he wasn't, uh, but because the approach is interesting. So he takes on board a lot of what he thinks is valuable from Stoicism, because there is a lot that is valuable yeah. in Stoicism. Yeah. But as a good skeptic, he 
he has the reserve clause and he says, yeah, but I'm not going to take the whole system on board. I am going to pick and choose. I'm going to pick and choose in a way that makes sense to me on the basis of evidence and, and good reasoning, what I think is good reasoning. But I will not accept a system uh, as you know wholesale because uh, that binds me too much to a particular set of assumptions that I'm not comfortable with. Got it. Yeah, and that that, that does seem to tie those two ideas together, right? Brings it together in a, in a nice uh, coherent package. So that that would be definitely worth unpacking a little bit more. Uh, right. I think it's <laughs> um, one quick question. You're going to be speaking at the How to Like It's In Festival, you said next week, right? Yes. Can you give our listeners a preview of what you're going to be talking about there? I, I know you probably don't want to give too much away, but what's the? It's it's about um, the metaverse, right? If if I was reading. Yeah, I'm doing. Uh, usually, you know, they have you get do three three or four things um, uh, yeah. at uh, at these festivals. Okay. One is actually a solo a solo talk. What they call a I think they call it a hat session. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. So that's a solo talk. And it will be as skepticism as a philosophy of life, uh, oh. where we'll th I'll be talking about some of the stuff that we've been uh, conversing about. Uh, yes, one of the the panels is going to be on the on these metaverse understood as, you know, a la Zuckerberg. So, so, so yeah. virtual reality kind of thing. Um, and whether that's a good idea or, or not. And without giving, I guess, too much, why I can tell you that just a few weeks ago I quit cold turkey both Facebook and Twitter. So that tells you where I stand on, yeah. <laughs> on yeah. that particular question. <laughs> At some point I realized that look, on the one hand, these are tools, these are technological tools, right? And so they're not intrinsically good or bad, that they're just what people make of them, right? And that's what I've been telling me for years myself for years, when I was using Twitter and Facebook in, a, in what I thought was a reasonable fashion. But at the same time, as I mentioned earlier on, when we were talking about Facebook engineers figuring out that the, the angry icon is the one that people look most, uh, we also need not to be blind to the fact that these tools are not themselves neutral. They are built by people, by certain people in certain ways for certain purposes. And those purposes are not the enlightenment of human humanity. Uh, you know, they, they, the, the purpose is to make money uh, and and to gather as many uh, you know hits as possible. Therefore, I at some point I simply realized that this was taking too much of my time, too much of my emotional energy, and not really giving enough of a return. And I said, nah, I'm I'm done. <laughs> I just interviewed uh, Stephanie Hare. She wrote a book called Technology is Not Neutral, and we had a long conversation about some of the things you're just describing. So uh, yeah. our listeners might find that interesting. I'll look it up. That sounds interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, 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 I'm just, um, it, we're going through review now, so it's going to be published in, uh, right. in the next couple of weeks, but it, it'll probably be interesting to you. Massimo, it was a really fantastic conversation. I wish we had another hour to talk. Um, hopefully, maybe down the road, we can connect again and uh, pick up some of these topics. Uh, maybe do a follow-up after your How the Light Gets In Festival. I'd love to hear how that went and how that dialogue went. But uh, really, really enjoyed uh, speaking with you, and I, I really, really appreciate your time. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having me.